Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, of which this is the last lesson in that series, is on the Gospel of Mark. It has been a very interesting, enlightening series. This, is, this lesson is for September 28th of 2024, and the title is The Risen Lord. Well, you would expect that to be the end of the story, wouldn't you? <laughs> Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you very much for this marvelous ending to a terrible story. The crucifixion and the burial and all the terrible things that happened to Jesus and now the glorious ending. Help us to comprehend what you want us to learn from this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, from our last lesson, we remember that three men cooperated in taking Jesus' body down from the cross and placing him in the tomb. Those three men were Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and John the disciple. Meanwhile, the women, Mary Magdalene, Salome, and Mary the mother of Joseph, were watching and saw where the body was placed. All four of the Gospels spend several chapters at the end of their Gospels talking about that final week in the life of Jesus. And we have a pretty good idea why they did that, don't we? Clearly, there was a sequence. He died, he was buried, he arose, and he was seen by a number of people. All of that happened within a three-day period. Wow. I mean, just imagine <laughs> that kind of roller coaster of events. As we entered the study of the last chapter of Mark, Jesus was in the tomb after suffering and dying at the cross, on the cross. The disciples were discouraged, even dejected, not knowing what to do or think, even though Jesus had told them he would be killed and then be raised to life. Jim? From the Bible, Bible, from the Bible study guide. <laughs> the crucifixion of Jesus destroyed the hopes and faith of his disciples. It was dark week, excuse, excuse me, it was a dark weekend weekend for them as they did not only grapple with their master's death, but feared for their own lives as well. John 20, verse 19 from the Bible study guide. The question that should have arisen in your mind is, considering what we have studied so far in this lesson, and in this series of lessons, I perhaps should have said, where were the disciples? Except for who? John. How did they react to Jesus' death? What did it take to change them from people hiding behind locked doors into the gospel spreading workers who spread the truth around the Mediterranean world in a single generation? Larry? From the Bible study guide, the event of Jesus' death was devastating for his followers. Through prophecy foretold, no, it, no it, and through Jesus had already forewarned them about the trials he would face prior to his death. The disciples' preconceived notions that the Messiah prevented them from understanding the full import of Jesus' words and thus left them unprepared for its impact. From our Bible study guide, yeah. Why could not the best teacher who ever lived on the earth clarify to his students which, what was going to happen to him in a way that they could grasp and understand. For three years, they were with him. Well, yeah. some of them three and a half years, but yeah. mostly, most less. God, when Jesus as a teacher does not pummel people into submission, he, and- No, but I mean, I mean he's, <clears throat> teachers, I mean, he, he, teachers aren't supposed to pummel people into submission. I know, but, but sometimes it, you're, you're, you're paradigm that you have or the filter that you have from your past experience has an awful lot of weight and it takes time to process new data. So three and a half years is not long enough? Perhaps not. Especially when you have a preconceived notion. Yeah. And how long, paradigm, how long did it take Paul yeah. to change his paradigm after the Damascus Road? It was <laughs> years, wasn't it? Well, it was at least five years before he went out and yeah. did anything. You know, everybody has a pope. Yeah. A paradigm of preconceived errors, P-O-P-E. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, well women are popular, if you like. Yeah. yeah, women were some of Jesus' closest followers. In Mark 16, we read about the women who, after the close of the Sabbath, at the beginning of the first day of the week, purchased spices to anoint the body of Jesus. They prepared on, on Sabbath night and then went to the tomb to tend to his body. Now, we know that these were not poor women. Mary Magdalene had done what? Prostitution. Purchased a bottle of perfume that cost a year's wages. These are not poor women. But they were unaware that Nicodemus had purchased 100 pounds and put that in with his burial. 100 pounds of myrrh and what was the other one? Aloe. Yeah, yeah aloe. So they maybe didn't know that and brought their yeah. add to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we, you know, with so many important dyes, and there's a lot of people, you bring roses and you bring flowers and all this kind of stuff. I, that's probably kind of like what's going on here. Maybe so. Okay. Whose turn is it? Larry. There? Lorna. Yeah, Larry. It's oh, Lorna. Lorna. I'm sorry. The women? The women who had stood by the cross of Christ waited and watched for the hours of the Sabbath to pass. On the first day of the week, very early, they made their way to the tomb taking with them precious spices to anoint the Savior's body. They did not think about his rising from the dead. The sun of their hope had set, and night had settled down on their hearts. As they walked, they recounted Christ's words of mercy and his words of comfort, but they remembered not his words, I will see you again. Mm. John 16, 22. Wow. Early on Sunday, the angel called Jesus from the tomb and he rose from the dead by the power within himself. So this is an important part of the story, which is not a part of the regular quarterly. From um, Desire of Ages, Ellen White wrote, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, thy father calls thee, the savior came forth, from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now is proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Quote, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. <clears throat> okay, very early Sunday morning, the woman took the spices to the tomb. They wondered who would roll the stone back for them, but it was already rolled back. I wonder if they had any idea. They obviously, they didn't have any idea who had rolled it back. And they saw a young man sitting at the spot where Jesus had been laid. That young man told them not to be alarmed because Jesus had risen from the dead. He said that they needed to tell Peter and the others to meet him in Galilee. But the women were frightened and did not say anything to anyone. So they weren't really good witnesses, were they? <laughs> well, it seems like they, if they're going to the tomb to anoint the body, they should have taken a male with them to roll the stone away. Yeah, you would so have thought so. So they were surprised, so. you say, who, I mean, talking they, among themselves, who's gonna roll the stone away? Why didn't they take somebody with them? And oh. if, they were, if they were there at the burial, the, the hundred soldiers must have been there, the Roman the soldiers, soldiers. were not gonna open that tomb. Well, I mean, they I- They would, for women. <laughs> no, they, they were charged keep this body sealed. Exactly. So they were not going to open it. So what yeah. were the women thinking yeah. that without taking somebody with them? Yeah. Were okay. They, they were strong out. women. The disciples were hidden. <laughs> they weren't going to come out of the Okay. Room. Who's going to read us the story of oh. Matthew 16? That would Matthew be Myra. 16, one Mark 16. Mark, Mark. Mark. Pardon me. <laughs> After the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early Sunday morning, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they said to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? So at least that question was in their minds. Yeah. yeah but but yeah. bring a mechanism to get yeah. rolled. Well, they didn't think about it ahead of yeah, time. Well. They just you know, figured something yeah. would work. Then they looked up and saw the stone was already rolled back. So they entered the tomb where they saw a young man sitting on the right, wearing a white robe, and they were alarmed. 
Were they alarmed by the white robe or there was a man? <laughs> the man. <laughs> the man. What? Somebody was sitting there and not laying down. Yeah. Dead. Uh, don't be alarmed. Now, does it mean this alarm? Does this mean they were really scared, or just mean they were surprised? I'm sure. That well, it was certainly not what they expected. No. Well, many things had happened in the last 24 hours. Oh, oh you think so? <laughs> and never know what to expect to next, right? To walk into a tomb where the stone is rolled back already. I, and there's somebody sitting yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. It would be a little scary, I think. Anyway, he says, don't be alarmed, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, but he is not here. He has been raised. Look, there is a place where this is, here is the place where they put him. Now go and give this message to his disciples, including Peter. And Why this is, is Peter's Peter? Gospel. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He is going to Galilee ahead of you, where you will see him, just as he told you. Reminding them of the conversation before. So they went out and ran from the tomb, distressed and terrified. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Okay, now, afraid, were they afraid that if they told people they wouldn't believe it? Well, I'm sure they, that came across. Yeah. After all, they're women, and women aren't to be believed. Yeah. Well, Mark 16, 7 tells us that the women were instructed to tell Peter and the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. That story of meeting in Galilee is recorded in John 21, and on a separate occasion is recorded in Matthew 28. So, if you want to go there and look at those verses on another occasion. Although Mark does not record it, the women were not the first ones to see the angels. So here's something else that I thought should be included here. From Ellen G. White, staggering like drunken men, they, the Roman soldiers, hurried on to the city, telling those whom they met the wonderful <coughs> news. They were making their way to Pilate, but their report had been carried to the Jewish authorities and the chief priests and rulers sent for them to be brought first into their presence. A strange appearance those soldiers presented. Trembling <laughs> with fear, their faces colorless. These are supposed to be the impregnable, the fierce Roman soldiers. This is the secret service. <laughs> <laughs> Trembling with fear, their faces colorless, they bore testimony to the resurrection of Christ. The soldiers told all, just as they had seen it. They had not had time to think or speak anything but the truth. With painful utterance, they said, it was the Son of God who was crucified. We have heard an angel proclaiming him as the majesty of heaven, the King of glory. Okay, now I got to interrupt. They're now calling him Son of God. Son of God. What did the angel say to them? That, probably that. <laughs> we have come to <clears throat> retrieve the Son of God. And we're going to read a little bit later on who these angels were, and we're going to talk about how they might have been involved earlier. Okay, go ahead. The faces of the priests were as those of the dead. <laughs> Caiaphas, Caiaphas tried to speak. His lips moved, but they uttered no sound. The soldiers were about to leave the council room when a voice stayed them. Caiaphas, is that Caiaphas? Caiaphas. Well, it depends on how you pronounce it. Uh, the, the way it's, it's punctuated in, in, in Greek, it's Caiaphas. Oh. It's each separate letter. Caiaphas had at last found speech. Wait, wait, he said. Tell no one the things you have seen from the desire. I mean, you, something like this happens to you and you're not going to go home and tell your wife? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. This is yeah, ridiculous. Nobody's going to believe you, so. <laughs> yeah. They were going to witness more than the Marys and the Mary Magdalene. Yeah, and you know, this is Passover weekend. There were people, thousands, millions of people milling around. And they must have spoken to all kinds of people. Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but. Why were the soldiers so afraid? Were they afraid of the Jewish leaders? Or the Roman, so, uh, the Roman leaders? Or were they just afraid that no one would believe them? I think they were afraid of, their task yeah. was to prevent that body from disappearing. Yeah. And so they were afraid that they messed up on their 
their role. I think but they, they were also all, they were afraid that they had just seen lightning yes. flash from the sky and right. then a person was there talking to them. I mean, it was just a shocking, yeah. scary, scary thing. And they just, their lives had changed forever, I'll bet. Yeah. What were you and I have like deserting your post. You know, yeah. In the military, if you yeah. desert your post, you're exactly. you be arrested. So these failed in their no, charge. Not just arrested, but executed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I one of the questions I ask myself is, before Paul got to Rome, there was a not a huge but a thriving church in Rome. Is it possible that some of these soldiers went back home from part of that Hardy. church? Part of that church. Mm. Interesting. Well, Interesting. well, we've talked about some of the possibilities there. Let us give a preview of Jesus' appearances on that resurrection day. Jesus appeared to a weeping Mary Magdalene in the garden. When she told the disciples that he was risen, they did not believe her. Then the Gospel of Luke details and Mark mentions about Jesus' trip to the countryside on the road to Emmaus when he walked with two of his other followers. Mark 16, Luke 24. Finally, Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples who were cowering, unbelieving in the upper room. He scolded them because they did not have faith and because they were too stubborn to believe those who had seen him alive. Wow, that's pretty potent language, isn't it? Okay, almost all of Mark 16, 9 through 20 has parallels to other passages in the New Testament. Mary Magdalene at the tomb, seeing Jesus and Matthew there, 28, 1, 9 and 10, John 20, 11 to 18, compared with Luke 8, 20, 8, 2. Two disciples see him on the countryside, Luke 24, 13 to 35. The 11 disciples are commissioned, Matthew 28 and Luke 24 and John 20. In John 20, 11 through 18, we read of Mary, who was the first one to whom Jesus appeared. She immediately fell at his feet. He had to say, do not hold on to me or keep holding, on, holding him because he had not yet ascended to the Father. Jesus asked Mary to tell his disciples that he was alive. However, they did not believe Mary. Mary, you know, this one just blows me away. Mary had been traveling with them and working with them for years. And they still didn't believe her. They didn't believe well, Jesus. Yeah. He told them he was coming back. <laughs> this is also true. So this is also they were true. hiding up in a room. Wow. So this is not just anyone. This is the sister of Lazarus. Isn't this the sister of Lazarus? Yes. Mm -hmm. Who had been raised from the dead? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Why do you suppose Mary was the first one to whom Jesus revealed himself? He could have gone straight to the disciples. <coughs> he could have gone to the Jewish leaders. Wouldn't that have been <laughs> a scenario? However, there in the garden, he spoke first to Mary, the former demon possessed prostitute. Hmm. Was it because she was there? He already knew that even when she told her story, the disciples would not believe it. I think it was an honor for her because she had been so devoted. Oh, yeah. And she had had such a struggle and he had healed her. She was very special to him. Yeah. And he, he knew her heart. Like yeah. there must be something we don't, you know, mm -hmm. that he you, trusted her. Do you think it was because she was the one that was there or was it these other reasons? I think it was because she was there. See, if, again, if you go to Ellen White, she says all the women came with the spices and all this stuff. They, they found the, the tomb was open. They saw the, the person, one or two, we saw at least one anyway. And then the other women ran away and Mary chose to stay. So she was there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine in our day asking a formerly demon-possessed prostitute to carry the premier announcement of the Gospels to the General Conference Committee? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy answer, wasn't yeah. it? Wow. Some of the people at the tomb saw one young man, but others saw two angels. If you if we had time, we'd go read John 20, 11 through 18. Now we know more about who those two angels were. 
careful reading of the gospel stories will reveal that some of the people who went to the tomb saw one angel while others saw two. Ellen White tells us that the two most exalted angels from heaven had been working as Jesus' guardian angels throughout his life, and they were the ones who came to open the tomb. Mm -hmm. So what other time did an angel come and help him? Yes. A very special angel. Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. Garden of Gethsemane. I'm sure it was one of these same two men, the same two angels. Later in the day, Jesus walked with those two men on their way to Emmaus, and he gave them many details about interpretations of passages in the Old Testament before he revealed himself as the risen Savior. Man, I wish we had a recording of that discussion. <laughs> wow. But when those men went back to the upper room with the excited, this exciting story, what? The disciples still do not believe them either. These are men now. Mark 16, 12 through 13. Jim? After this, Jesus appeared in a different manner to two of them while they were on their way to the country. Uh, to the country. They returned and told the other disciples, the others that said them disciples, but they would not believe it from the Good News Bible. I mean, how many people have to come to you and say, I saw this, this, this. Oh, we saw this, this. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Well, they knew what happened. They knew that he was crucified. They knew he was in the tomb. Yeah. After the, and here's, here's the, the clincher here. After the walk, the walk to Emmaus, those two young men raced back to Jerusalem in the dark stumbling over the path to reach the locked upper room to bring the good news to the waiting disciples. And when they entered, Jesus entered with them, unseen. Before the encounter on the road to Emmaus, road to Emmaus, did any of the followers of Jesus have a correct picture of why he came to this earth? Or were they still looking for Messiah to overthrow the hated Romans? Larry? For the Bible study guide. Uh, we, <clears throat> but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. That was found in Luke 24, verses 21. What do, you, <clears throat> what do the disciples mean by the words, redeem Israel? The Greek word for redeem is litrio, uh, which has a basic meaning of to liberate, from an oppressive situation. Okay. So skip the danker thing. Go. So for the disciples, the death of Jesus meant the death of their earthly aspirations, for they conceived redemption in terms of liberation from Roman, from the Roman oppression. From our Bible study guide. And now my repeat my words, don't you wish you had a recording of those explanations that Jesus gave to the man on the road to Emmaus? and later to the disciples. Would I think that, we do. Hmm? I think we do. Think we do? It's the sermon of, uh, of Stephen as he was killed. The, the, the sermons of the apostles. Yeah. The, I, the, I, the, the, the two on the road to Emmaus remembered what he told them, probably most of it. Yeah. And they, they told people, and that's the sermons they gave. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think this is the pattern for the gospel sermons that were given all over the Mediterranean world. I think we have to be very gentle to the disciples who hung on to their preconceived notions relentlessly. They had seen Jesus, they had met Jesus, but once they understood, they yeah. did, couldn't understand, they just were blocked on that. But once they did, they were the most powerful preachers we've ever seen. Yeah, they ever couldn't heard of. unsee it after that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was just, yeah. Would they were that, persuaded. Yeah. <laughs> would that give all the Old Testament evidence pointing toward the life and mission to Jesus? Surely Jesus must have tried to explain some of those things earlier in, the, in, in their times together. Where are all those details found in the Old Testament? Were they found in some documents we no longer have available to us? Well, that's possible. It is true that it is not every day that someone rises from the dead. So the news was not easy for the discouraged disciples to believe. Well, they'd already had the story of Lazarus. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you remember, who was it? Oh, the, uh, 
uh, well, you also have the legends and the rich man too. And, yeah. the, and the, rich, the rich man says, well, I got five brothers, warn them so they don't come back into this place. And Jesus says, hey, they've got Moses and the prophets. Yeah. Even if they, somebody rises from the dead, there's no one not going to believe it because they're not willing to study. They, and they didn't believe it themselves. No. <laughs> okay. Who next? L Lorna? The Bible study guide. As we saw early in the quarter, Mark starts his gospel by stating that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, the people need to repent and believe in the gospel. Unfortunately, at the end of Mark's gospel account, Mark 16, people still possessed unbelieving hearts. These people were not the priests, nor the leaders of Israel, nor the Roman governor. They were Jesus' own disciples. Wow. Bible study guide. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Finally, Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples themselves in the upper room, and most of them believed. But what was the problem? How many people have you read about that Jesus scolded? Gordon? Mark, Mark 16, 14. Last of all, Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating. He scolded them because they did not have faith and because they were too stubborn to believe those who had seen him alive. Wow. Go ahead and take the next one there. John 20, 19. It was late that Sunday evening and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. And they were frightened again. <laughs> When Jesus suddenly appeared to the 11 disciples in the upper room, they were terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. But after he had assured them and ate a piece of cooked fish in front of them, he reminded them of many of the things that he had told them previously. And I guess finally their heart rate came down from Wasn't 200. The room locked? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought the room, I had understood the, the room was locked. And yeah. therefore, why would he be there? Because yeah. it was locked. Yeah. All that was written about him in the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms, which had to come true. But then he did something amazing. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Mm -hmm. What did he do? What did he tell them? Myra. I wish, wish he would do that to uh, yes. all of us. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Bible study guide says, the first words of Jesus to his disciples were recorded only in indirect discourse in Mark 16, 14. He rebukes them for their unbelief and hard-heartedness. The question of unbelief is not simply a modern problem. <laughs> yeah. As we've already seen, the original disciples of Jesus struggled with belief. And they were with Jesus in the flesh and saw again and again the miracles. Yeah. What did he say? Yeah. Uh, did he do something miraculous or did he just convince them finally? Did he do something miraculous? He just raised from the dead. Yeah. Well, like, like God did for Elijah at the cave, God wasn't in the fire or the earthquake or the wind. wind. He was in the still small voice of reason. Yeah. The still quiet voice of reasoning going through the scriptures. And the oh. message of truth doesn't need to be shouted from a rooftop or have big bullhorns or whatever. So, but if you read John 20, verses 24 to 29, even Thomas, one of the 11, could not believe the truth about the resurrection despite all that the other disciples and the women said until he saw Jesus for himself. Imagine what a problem it would be in our day if nobody would believe without seeing for themselves. Luke 24, 34 says that Simon Peter also had seen Jesus. However, we do not know anything else about that appearance if it was a separate appearance. Of course, the first question for the disciples, other followers of Jesus and us, would have to be, is Jesus truly alive? Did Jesus really come to life after being dead in the tomb? Was the resurrection real? And lots of people have questioned about that. And so now we're going to look at some of the challenging ways of trying to answer some of those questions. 
What are some of the reasons that we have already mentioned why this story of Jesus' resurrection cannot be, be a ma made-up story? From the Bible Study Guide. The first person among his followers to see Jesus alive was Mary Magdalene, found in John 20, verses 11 to 18. Other women saw him as well, from Matthew 28, 8 to 10. It is significant that the first people to see the risen Lord were women, because women in the ancient world... Technically, I I'm sorry, I interrupt for a second. Technically, that's not correct. A whole lot of Roman soldiers had yeah. seen him before that. And they ran. And, and they, they told everybody they saw him. I thought the Bible says they fell as dead. Well, at the moment, yeah. Yeah, so they, they were they, uh, they were kind of like comatose. So yeah. I think the stone rolling, it, because here's this flash and the angels coming down, mm -hmm. and they, I thought them being not really witnessing it because they were... Well, they witnessed enough because they were telling. Okay, well, that's true. <laughs> Put enough fear into them anyway. Okay, sorry, Jennifer, I interrupt you. Because women in the ancient world did not have high status as witnesses, if the story were fabricated, it would have been much more likely to name men as the first witnesses. But it is not men, not the 11, but a woman. She goes to tell the good news to the disciples, but not surprisingly, they do not believe her testimony, most likely because it seemed fantastic and also, unfortunately, because Mary was a woman. Oh, dread thought. Hmm. The gospel show the new church leaders, the apostles, in a very bad light. That would not be likely if the resurrection had been made up by the apostles. So our Bible study guide goes on. Of course, if they were making this story up, why would they have made themselves look so bad? <laughs> that doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus had to rebuke them for their hardness of heart. The gospel accounts from the time of his arrest to his appearances after the resurrection depict the follower of Jesus in a very negative light, fleeing, denying, disbelieving, and so forth. This would make no sense if the story were made up by the disciples or the apostles. In contrast, their later bold and unwavering proclamation of the risen Christ and the hope it offers everyone presents powerful evidence for the veracity of their claims. Jim? Even the atheist historians, those who cannot accept the reality of the resurrection, admit not only that Jesus had been killed, but that after his death, many people claim to have seen a resurrection Christ. And as a result, they began the nucleus of what became the Christian church. And so it's pretty hard to deny that much. Okay, go ahead. Some, in an attempt to explain why they claimed this, said that Jesus had a twin brother or that the early oh, disciples yeah. <laughs> hallucinated, thinking that they saw Jesus. Others said that Jesus never really died, but only swooned, that is, fainted with emotion and then later revived. Another person claimed that aliens came down and took the body for a, for a look at the, all three segments and see how they don't work. See Clifford Goldstein's book, Risen, Finding Hope in the Empty Tomb. Okay. Think about the situation that the disciples were in. They were now the focus of the hatred of the Jewish leaders. Would they have lied about the resurrection if it had not been true and thus caused even more hatred? Why didn't the Jewish leaders accuse them of lying? Hmm. What is the evidence for resurrection of Jesus? Now let's look at the other side. Okay, from the Bible study guide. Some people find it incredible that Christians believe in a risen Lord, but the evidence for the resurrection is substantial and is consistent with reason. For starters, all one has to do is believe in God as the creator that we find in Genesis 1 and 2. And the idea of the resurrection of a miracle becomes reasonable. The God who created the universe and then life on earth certainly had the power if he chose to resurrect Jesus. The existence of God doesn't make the resurrection of Jesus inevitable only reasonable. Next, the tomb was definitely empty. 
Even atheist historians accept that fact. If it were not, the claim about his resurrection would fail right from the start because the existence of his body there would destroy any claims of his having risen. It would be a little hard to claim that he had risen if, oh, there's the body. <laughs> yeah, right. Next, uh, the explanation that his disciples stole the body does not work. The disciples surely couldn't have gotten past the guards. Some of them presumably were not comatose. Yeah. Uh, and even if they had done so and got the body, why were the disciples never arrested for stealing it? The answer is that the religious leaders knew that the disciples had not done it. Yeah. Also, numerous people testified that they had saw the risen Christ. Many, including the disciples, did not at first believe. And one very solid enemy, Paul, not only claims to have seen the risen Lord, but that this experience changed his whole trajectory of his life in a very radical ways too. Finally, though there are many other reasons, how does one explain the rise of the Christian church founded by people who claimed to have seen the risen Lord? Why would these people have been willing to die for what they knew was a lie? Their constant testimony, both right after his death, as seen in Acts 3.15, uh, and years later in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, provides powerful evidence for his resurrection. I'm going to take a moment here and look at Acts 3.15. You remember how Peter denied anything about Jesus because that maid pointed a finger at him and says, now look what happens in Acts 3.15. You, this is Peter, speaking to the Sanhedrin, you killed the one who leads to life, but God raised him from death, and we are witnesses of this. Huh. You killed him. We're witnesses. Was there any denial on their part of them? Nope. One of the most impressive reasons for believing that the story of the resurrection is true is found in Acts 4, 5 through 17. I just mentioned a part of that. Peter and John stood up in front of the Sanhedrin Council, the very ones who had arranged for the crucifixion of Jesus. Peter directly accuses them of being responsible for the death of the Son of God. I wonder how many in that room realized what he was saying was true. Yeah. Well, I will take you, let me just take you there for a second. Look at this. Um, hold on here. my. I didn't need that. Yeah. What are you taking us to? Uh, Acts 6, verse 7. It's not typing. There, there was a pop-up. Yeah. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Wow. Now, if they're priests, they should already have the faith. <laughs> <laughs> they should have. Yes, they should have. It wasn't true. I mean, these are the people from the Sanhedrin. Yeah. The Sadducees. And then if you go over to chapter 15, verse 5, and they had that great conference about whether or not it's all right to baptize and, and welcome Gentiles into the church, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood by and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. <laughs> so while well, they may have, they we may have, have, been, have rules. <laughs> they may they may have been believers. They hadn't given up some of their own ideas, had they? Okay. Um, one of the challenging issues that we have tried to study is the secrecy motif. The fact that Jesus throughout almost his entire ministry kept telling people not to talk about who he was or what he had done for them. God clearly knew what would happen when he told people not to say something about what had happened to them. I mean, if you tell your kids, okay, don't, you know, we're, we're having a birthday party for mama, okay? Don't tell her. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> what, are the, what are the chances, you know? Well, I mean, it's way more than that. Of course, God yeah. knew exactly. 
So God clearly knew what would happen when he told the people. To, so, they would, so why did he tell them to be quiet when he knew they would not be? Where are we here? Lorna. Lorna. Oh, from, from the Bible study guide, from the beginning of the gospel, the reader knows that Jesus is the Messiah. But in the text itself, the first non-demon possessed person who <laughs> proclaims him the Messiah <laughs> is Peter in Mark 8:29, And this profession doesn't happen until halfway through the book. Yeah. That's an odd adjective for somebody. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're the non-demon person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go ahead and read what it says there in Mark. Uh, Mark 8, 29. What about you? He, Jesus asked them, the disciples, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah from the Good News Bible. Yeah. Throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus told people to keep quiet about who he was and about a healing that he did for them in Mark 1, Okay, before we read on, Let's talk about that for a second. Why do you think Jesus told him not to tell? He probably didn't want the demons to be the major source of witness. Well, that would certainly be true. Anybody else? We're going to read in a short time, or you're going to say in a short time, that they had the wrong conception of what the Messiah was. Yep. The well, Messiah the is going to, going to kick out the Romans. He's going to make us free people. Yeah. But that yeah. obviously went until crucifixion. The yeah. disciples were hiding because they had the wrong conception. So. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. In Mark 1, he told a leper to tell no one of his healing. In Mark 5, he told Jairus and his wife to tell no one of the raising of their daughter. You know, I, you know again, I have to interrupt. Okay, here's a girl that you, th that's, quote, dead. And everybody's mourning and weeping and carrying on. And Jesus says, okay, just a few, three disciples in the family is there. Okay, so the girl comes prancing out of the house alive, and you say, uh, don't tell anybody that she's alive. Yeah. <laughs> if God knew uh, you were going to tell, yeah. why did Jesus keep saying, don't tell? Yeah. Okay. He wasn't done yet. Go ahead. Uh, uh, in Mark 7.36, he told a group not to tell people about his healing of a deaf and mute man. Then he commanded his disciples not to tell people that he was the Messiah. Mark 8.30, see also his command. He commanded his disciples not to tell people that he was the Messiah. See also Mark 9.9. 9. No doubt the main reason for Jesus telling them to be silent was to give him time to finish his ministry according to the time prophecies of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And that's true, but that's just a, a, a small part of the whole picture. I think what we've suggested is that they had a completely wrong idea about what the Messiah was going to do. He wanted to uh, approach them or have them listen without being bedazzled by, by charisma. Or, or, or completely overwhelmed because their minds are racing, saying, but, but he's supposed to come and save us from the Romans. That's a, that's a... Jesus did not want people to say he was the Messiah because the Jews had such a distorted view of what the Messiah would do. Furthermore, if people were told that he was the healer, the crowds would have been even worse than they were, and he would not have had the opportunity to speak about the gospel and explain why he had come to this earth. And there's several passages. But mm -hmm. they did tell. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what would happen. It did happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like because he told them not to tell, they didn't. They told and they told and they told. Would, would it be, have been even worse if they had, he had not told them? Yes. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Ellen White in Desire of Ages says, Reasoning from prophecy, Christ gave his disciples a correct idea of what he was to be in humanity, their expectation of a Messiah who was to take his throne and kingly power in accordance with the desires of men has had been misleading. So it was their expectations that were misleading. Yeah. It would interfere with a correct apprehension of his descent. Is that a correct apprehension or correct comprehension anyway, mm -hmm. of his descent from the highest to the lowest position that could be occupied. 
Christ desired that the ideas of his disciples might be pure and true in every specification. They must understand as far as possible in regard to the cup of suffering that had been apportioned to them, apportioned to him. He showed them that the awful conflict which they could not yet comprehend was the fulfillment of the covenant made before the foundation of the world was laid. Christ must die as every transgressor of the law must die if he continues in sin. All this would, all this was to be, but it was not to be in defeat, but in glorious eternal victory. Jesus told them that every effort was to, must be made to save the world from sin. His followers must live if he lived. Yes. His followers must live as he lived and work as he worked with intense, persevering effort. Desire of Ages 799. Yeah. However, once that critical crucifixion weekend had transpired, the situation changed. Before long, everyone was talking about what had happened. The two men who accompanied Christ to the countryside, I always have to chuckle when I read this story, turned and looked at him and not recognizing who he was, said, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening the last few days? I mean, this was Passover weekend and someone came uh, about 40, 40 years later or something and estimated that at Passover, there were two million people in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Two million people in Jerusalem. And I suspect at this time, there might've been even more. Are you the only one, all of those people who doesn't know what's been happening in the last few days? Are there times today when we should be quiet about some aspects of the gospel? Do some people just find the stories boring? How can we make the gospel more exciting and interesting to the people in 2024? And let me just give some examples. We don't start off by talking about the three angels' messages. We, don't, we usually don't start off by telling people, you have gotta stop worshiping on Sunday and start worshiping on Saturday. Uh, that will come, but that's not first thing. We don't usually start off right off by telling people, your ideas about what happens to the dead is wrong. You know, so there are some things that's probably coming. God in. loves you. Yeah, God <laughs> loves you, right. Anyway, we know that the rest of the story is that the gospel was carried to the Mediterranean world in one generation. Peter's gospel written by Mark describes the last encounter of the disciples with Jesus as they talked while they walked to the Mount of Olives and then his ascension. Okay. Mark 16, verses 15 to 20. He said to them, go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Believers will be given the power to perform miracles. They will drive out demons in my name. They will speak strange tongues in strange tongues. If they pick up snakes and drink any poison, they will not be harmed. They will place their hands on sick people who will get well. After the Lord Jesus had talked with him, he was taken up to heaven and set at the right side of God. The disciples went and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and proved that their teaching was true by the miracles that were performed. Yeah, we, could, we, we know about just a few of those, but they had a pretty big impact. It is interesting that in addition to saying that the disciples would be able to speak in foreign languages, cast out demons, and perform miracles as they spread the gospel to the world, it also says they would be able to pick up snakes and drink any poison without being harmed. And some of you know that there are actually, there have been so-called so Christian churches that try to prove that we're the run church because, by, by handling for poisonous snakes. Sometimes it doesn't work. An example of that is found in Acts 28, three to six, when Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake and nothing happened to him. This is certainly not an indication that we can prove our authenticity by handling poisonous snakes. <clears throat> Finally, 40 days after his resurrection and just before he ascended into the cloud of angels, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 20. How does that actually work? From Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages. To the believer, Christ is the resurrection and the life. In our Savior, 
the life that was lost through sin is restored, for he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. He is invested with the right to give immortality. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. Quote, I am come, he said, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. From John 10:10, 10, 10, 4:14, and 6:54. To the believer, death is but a small matter. Christ speaks of it as if it were of little moment. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. He shall never taste of death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Okay. Do you find any evidence in the stories of the Gospels that the disciples ever fully understood the purposes of Jesus' life and death? No. Now, who do we find tried to explain it later? Paul. Paul. Well, Jesus explained why he was born. Yeah, well. Did they, they, well did he they, also says, says he also he came for judgment. The yeah. question is, what does that judgment mean? Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty simple. He came to you so that you could, you've heard it, you've heard it said, and then he says, this is what it really means. Yeah. That that's judgment. That's not a, not a, you know, I'm the judge and I'm telling you where, where, where to go. No, it's, it's, it, it's to make a separation in, in your thinking. What we see actually seems to hap have happened was they just told the story as it happened. Yeah. And they leave their generation and us to draw their own or our own conclusions. So the spirit of Antichrist has been active, hadn't it, for the yeah. last couple of thousand years? Ellen White tried to explain the ascension in some detail. Quote, before leaving his disciples, Christ plainly stated the nature of his kingdom. He called to their minds what he had previously told them concerning it. So we don't know about those instances, but at least we know that he had told them. He declared that it was not his purpose to establish in this world a temporal, but a spiritual kingdom. He was not to reign as an earthly king on David's throne. Again, he opened to them the scriptures, showing that all he had passed through had been ordained in heaven and the counsels between the Father and himself. All had been foretold by men inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said, you see, that all I have revealed to you concerning my rejection as the Messiah has come to pass. All I have said in regard to the humiliation I should endure and the death I should die has been verified. On the third day I rose again, searched the scriptures more diligently, and you will see that in all these things the specifications of prophecy concerning me have been fulfilled. That's quite a thing. We, we struggle with those places in the old, to find places in the Old Testament where it clearly, you know, clear spelled out prophecy happened in the life of Christ and so forth. But you can see why, you know, if something's pre predicted. Well, think of Cyrus, for example. They, when he came in, down to see the Jews and what to do with them and so forth like this, they said, well, look, we knew you were gonna happen. Here's your name right in the inspired That's prophecy. Right in, yeah, right in, so, you know, that, that, would, that would make an impact, I think. Mm -hmm. Jesus looked beyond the ascension. He promised to come back. And then he gave the disciples the instructions to go into all the world. That challenge has been given to us as well. Alan White again. Jim, I think that's yours. But the command, go ye into all the world, is not to be lost sight of. We are called upon to lift our eyes to the regions beyond. Christ tears away the wall of partition, the dividing prejudice of nationality, and teaches a love for all, human fam for all of the human family. He lifts men from the narrow circle which their selfish 
Knesberg prescribes abolishes all territorial lines and artificial distinctions of society. He makes no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. He teaches us to look upon every needy soul as our brother and the world as our field. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 823. Okay, Larry. Okay, from the, uh, from also from Ellen G. White. Uh, while the disciples were still gazing upward, voices addressed them which sounded like richest music. They turned and saw two angels in the form of men who spoke to them saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. These angels were of the company that had been waiting in the shining cloud to escort Jesus to his heavenly home. The most exalted of the angels throng, they were the two who had come to the tomb at Jesus' resurrection, and they had been with him throughout his life on earth. Wow. So here it says that two highest, most important angels in heaven were God, Jesus' guardian angels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, you know, they must have struggled because the devil would have done anything he could to, to eliminate Jesus. Do you think it was easy for the disciples to go out to the people in Jerusalem and testify about the resurrection of Jesus? What kind of reception do you think they got? All four of the Gospels agree that Jesus died on Friday. There's all the references. And of course, the body of Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. If Jesus intended for them to change their day of worship to Sunday, this is not the right way to start that tradition. <laughs> While it was true that many Christian groups worship on Sunday, supposedly celebrating the resurrection, there is no command anywhere in the Bible to suggest that they should do that. We know first that he rose early on Sunday morning. This is not a reason for turning Saturday into a sacred day of worship. So what is the memorial that Jesus gave us to, to commemorate his death and resurrection? Baptism. 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 Yeah. That's it. I mean, there it is, right? You know, you're buried beneath the water, you're raised to life again. So that's why Jesus gave us that memorial of, of baptism. In Romans 6, 4. Yeah. By then our, our bapti by our baptism, then we are buried with him and shared his death in order that just as Jesus was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also he might live a new life. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these marvelous insights that are given to us uh, from Scripture, from the Gospel of Mark that we have studied intensively, and from others who have helped us, including Ellen White and the other Gospel writers. We look forward so much to that day when we'll be able to see the panorama and see all the details. We don't know how long it's gonna take, but let it take as long as it needs to see the story of the great controversy from beginning to end and all these details, I'm sure in, in, in great detail. We look forward to that time. May it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.